Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight on the ground in Minneapolis, a city consumed by grief and rage. Everybody is reacting off of pain. Black men dying every day. The police, the protests, the pain of past and present. It's a bit frustrating. I mean, we were doing so, we were doing really well. Job suspension for the doctor who brought COVID-19 into New Brunswick. There's so many questions and answers that, that we need as a family. But very few answers today from the RCMP about a long ago tip. And so many Canadians want to know, when's hockey? Players are no different than anyone else. The head of the NHL Players Union takes the hot seat. This is The National. Minneapolis is under curfew tonight, but there is little sign that people have been leaving the streets. As we've seen over the past few days, peaceful protests have at times been marred by vandalism and violence. This is a city on edge. And as we'll show you tonight, it goes well beyond Minnesota. Angry, sometimes violent crowds across the United States show that a raw nerve has been touched again, this time by the death of George Floyd, an unarmed black man in police custody. The officer directly involved, who is white, has now been arrested. Former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin has been charged by the Hennepin County Attorney's Office with murder and with manslaughter. Questions? Well, a big question now is whether that arrest will eventually cool tensions as protests continue on scorched streets patrolled by heavily armed police and the National Guard. Susan Ormiston shows us a community scarred and still full of rage. I can't breathe. One man's pleading, now a potent cry for black Americans. Pent up anger. Over police brutality, compounded by quarantines and job losses, leaving South Minneapolis today charred and smoking from worsening violence. The ashes are symbolic of uh, decades and generations of, of pain, of anguish, unheard, much like we failed to hear. George Floyd. Overnight, demonstrators stormed the police precinct building, setting it ablaze. Police had abandoned it earlier for safety, said the mayor. But that meant little police surveillance or protection for hours as the fire burned and demonstrators ratcheted up street battles and looting. Reinforcements came later, setting up an armed perimeter, forcing people back. The National Guard, 500, are at the ready, and the governor is pleading for calm. Help us use humane way to get the streets to a place where we can restore the justice. A step today, the officer who pinned George Floyd to the ground, then kneeled on his neck, was charged with third-degree murder and manslaughter. This is by far the fastest we've ever charged a police officer. But no word yet on the other three officers who watched and were fired. Pressure now to arrest them too. They all need to be held accountable, just as if it was four black men that killed somebody. It's a decades-old pattern, different justice, says Floyd's brother. Everybody is reacting off of pain. Black men dying every day. <laughs> Minneapolis St. Paul's is bracing for another violent night as fury ricochets, undampened by a pandemic. There is a curfew tonight in the Twin Cities, all night till 6 tomorrow morning. The governor desperate to contain this violence that erupted all around here last night. You can see the charred remains of a business center and the precinct is just over here. You can still see beyond this truck the glow of fires already tonight and tear gas as state police tried to disperse the crowd still here to push them back. There are still hundreds around here swinging around in their trucks and waiting for the next thing to happen. There is a sense, too, that this isn't going to end. Even with the arrest of one police officer, even for murder charges, what's happened here has ignited protests across the country. And this idea of I can't breathe is 
really stirring up and igniting deep and painful injustices. People here aren't ready to let this go. They're still waiting for what will happen to those other officers and for some kind of real change before all of this will end. Ian. Susan Ormiston reporting from Minneapolis tonight. And after the unrest overnight, another police incident, this one was captured on camera live early this morning, the arrest of a CNN television crew. This is a scene here playing out in Minneapolis. CNN reporter Omar Jimenez was on the street doing his job when police began to lock down the area. We saw at least one, one protester, or, or at least someone who was not media, sort of run past us. We've got one person uh, being arrested here. They then turned toward us. Put, us. put us back where you want us. We are getting out of your way, so just let us know. He was heard repeatedly telling police his crew was prepared to move. The response? I'm sorry? You're under arrest. Okay. Do you mind telling me why I'm under arrest, sir? Why, why am I under arrest, sir? The crew's arrest was met with a chorus of outrage from CNN and other news organizations, which was echoed by Minnesota's governor, who apologized. I take full responsibility. There is absolutely no reason something like this should happen. The issue here is trust. The community that's down there that's terrorized by this, if they see a reporter being arrested, their assumption is, is because something's going to happen that they don't want to be seen. About an hour later, the crew was released without charges. Jimenez is calm in the moment, a product of professionalism, but also that his experience was being shared. It did cross my mind that what, what is really happening here? And I, the one thing that gave me a little bit of comfort was that it happened on live TV. From New York to Phoenix, San Jose to New Orleans, people marched today in solidarity. But in Atlanta, that devolved into violence at CNN's headquarters. They just threw something on fire, Chris, a firecracker. Yep. Something got fired. Protesters broke windows at the station, facing off against a row of police in riot gear, throwing objects, firecrackers, as you could see in here, and bottles. Earlier, they covered the sign with graffiti and chanted to police, Quit your jobs. Amid the chaos of the past 24 hours, the U.S. president grabbed attention for an overnight tweet widely seen as inciting violence, a warning that looters will be shot. Katie Simpson has more on what Trump said and the reaction. Thank you very much. Thank you. After ignoring questions at his own news conference and making no mention of what has unfolded in Minnesota, the president finally addressed a wounded nation while chairing a meeting with business leaders. The looters should not be allowed to drown out the voices of so many peaceful protesters. They hurt so badly. That's a much different tone from his overnight tweet. These thugs are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd. When the looting starts, the shooting starts, he wrote. A phrase linked to violent police crackdowns on African Americans in the 60s. Well, I've heard that phrase for a long time. I don't know where it came from. When you do have looting, like you had last night, people often get shot and they die, and that's not good, and we don't want that to happen. Mr. President, but Twitter slapped a warning on Trump's tweet for violating the rules around glorifying violence. From one of the gravest it comes a day after the president signed an executive frankly, order attempting to restrict well social media companies. It's not good. This is no time for incendiary treats, tweets. It's no time to encourage violence. This is a national crisis. We Democrats and Republicans right alike criticized Trump's choice of words. Perspective here. I do believe that you've got to have law and order, that we've got to stop the burning and looting. Uh, but uh, inciting, um, you know, violence with, with Twitter is not the way to go about it. Trump has repeatedly stoked divisions with his words, some of his policies and his online posts. Through each controversy, the president has simply continued to push forward. His words today have done little to soothe protesters who've now gathered right here at his doorstep. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Prime Minister Trudeau addressed the situation in Minneapolis, saying all Canadians, but in particular those of diverse backgrounds, are watching with shock and horror. Anti-black racism, racism is real. It's in the United States, but it's also in Canada. 
and we know people are facing systemic discrimination, unconscious bias and anti-black racism uh, every single day. We need, as a society, to stand together, stand up against discrimination, be there for each other in respect, but also understand that we have work to do as well in Canada, uh, in our systems that we need to work forward on. In Toronto, police have released new information about the fatal fall of a woman and how officers were involved. In a rare move, the city's police chief took questions on the matter today. The, the truth is out there. This organization is not hiding behind law. This organization wants this story to be told. And, and we want to be challenged with exactly what happened. Um, I, and I want to know what happened, and the community wants to know what happened, and more importantly, the family wants to know what happened. Police say there were three 911 calls from three separate people about an assault taking place the night that Regis Korchinski Paquette fell from a Toronto high rise. The family's lawyer says the incident was a mental health call, which was not appropriately handled by police. Ontario's police watchdog is now investigating. Two more people in Campbellton, New Brunswick, have tested positive for COVID-19, adding to an outbreak propelled by one doctor's apparent disregard for quarantine rules. Harry Forrestal explains. The people of Campbellton are being tested in more ways than one. At the local civic centre, dozens wait anxiously to be checked for signs of COVID-19. Frustrating. I mean, we were doing so, we were doing really well. I think we were almost like three weeks without any cases. It's sad. It's just sad. It's pretty, uh, pretty nerve-wracking. There's nobody that's, uh, that's safe. Everybody can get it. Health officials today confirmed two more cases of COVID-19, urged everyone who can to get tested, and warned the virus already shows signs of spreading. We know, based on our contact tracing of the current cases in Zone 5, that people living outside that region are in the circle of transmission. That circle now includes a local nursing home, where one of today's new COVID cases worked and where public health teams spent the day questioning and testing every resident and staff member. There could be 18 to 100 cases, but uh, the reason we're, we're hoping that there isn't is that we only have four ICU beds and there's already two being taken. Many here are angry and frustrated over the source of the infection. I'm not feeling good, especially that it comes from somebody that works in the, in the hospital. That someone is a doctor who failed to self-isolate after traveling to Quebec. His own child is one of the infected. Today, the health authority suspended him while they examine his role in this outbreak. But in the overheated chat rooms online, others may have already reached a verdict. What's going on on, on Facebook is pretty uh, horrendous, if you ask me. Uh, the comments, uh, people in Camelton are known to being friendly and accommodating, uh, helpful and hardworking. But uh, some of these comments are deplorable and hateful. With eight confirmed cases and more expected, that friendly, helpful reputation is certain to be tested too. Harry Forrestal, CBC News, Fredericton. Now let's hear some more from the mayor of Campbellton, Stephanie Engelhart paulin and, and mayor, what's it like in your community this evening? We're scared. I know uh, a lot of the uh, elderly people are afraid. Uh, we uh, we just have to reassure them that uh, we have all the resources available to us and that uh, this, this testing is going to help, uh, but uh, we're afraid. We know how vulnerable older people can be, and one of the people who's been infected worked at a, a nursing home, a long-term care home in your community. You have a small hospital in Campbellton. What has the impact been on those two facilities? It will be great. Uh, the ER de department was shut down and 50 employees were tested. So out of those 50 employees, six come back positive. So that's a ratio of 12%, which is too high. Um, it's 60% uh, of our population is over the age of 55. So the last thing we need is uh, COVID. This is a story about Campbellton, the impact there is on your small community. But, but what's the lesson here, if there is a lesson for other places in Canada? Don't be complacent. Don't think it's not here because you can't see it. And uh, be vigilant. Uh, it's something that we, after uh, April 8th, uh, we hadn't had a case in almost a month, and uh, we were 
believing it was gone. So in a minute, in the blink of an eye, it's back and with full force. So it's, uh, it's not something that anyone wants to wake up to, but uh, please say a prayer for us. Uh, we're gonna need your good thoughts. Well, we are thinking about Campbellton tonight. Mayor, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you for having me. From one province to another, the COVID picture remains quite different, but here's the overall snapshot tonight. Canada just shy of 90,000 cases. More than half of them are recovered or resolved, but more than 7,000 people have died. Quebec and Ontario still seeing hundreds of new cases daily, while in Manitoba there are no new cases and no COVID patients in hospital. And so Manitoba is on to phase two of getting back to business next week. The CBC's Cameron McIntosh tells us what that will look like at restaurants, gyms and schools. When the students come into the building, there's signage on our front door indicating that they'll wait here at the desk. They'll Screening at the door, one-way hallways, desks two metres apart. Next month, students at Winnipeg's Kelvin High will return for tutoring and meetings. The goal is to actually invite every student into our building. It's part of phase two of Manitoba's aggressive reopening plan. On Monday, restaurants can open to 50% capacity. Gyms and spas can come back, along with some organized sports, all under physical distancing rules. We need to learn how to live with this virus. Dr. Brent Rusin is Manitoba's top doctor. What's giving you the confidence to allow Manitoba to reopen to this extent? things that we're looking at is our uh, positive test rate of our tests and uh, uh, currently over the last five days that's at 0.07 percent. Uh, we don't have any clients in hospital with COVID-19. The province has had fewer than 300 COVID-19 cases, seven deaths. Manitoba started shutting down in mid-March and restricting travel when neighboring provinces started seeing cases. What's really broken Manitoba's way? You know, I think it's, it's really uh, the timing, that provincial-wide planning for six weeks before even seeing our first case, uh, the benefit of the, the timing of our, uh, of our spring break um, uh, has, has just really put us in this, in this position to, uh, uh, to be able to reopen things at this time. Still, it's not life as usual. Remember the school? It will likely look like this in September. We're certainly not done with this virus. Trying to find the balance of the new normal in life with COVID. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Meanwhile, Ontario is now considering different reopening schedules for different regions. But as Thomas Dagla shows, it's also expanding its testing strategy. Crossing into the U.S. every week, truck driver Trina Monez must face the coronavirus just to do her job. Her only fear is taking it home. Where have you been staying? In my truck. Full time? Yeah. I haven't seen my grandkids. I haven't seen my kids since Christmas. For essential workers like her, there may be encouraging news. Ontario's new blueprint for COVID-19 testing includes a plan to target a wide array of industries, from transport services to manufacturing and construction. We may uh, test a group within a setting to get a better understanding of that as well. In a province that first had a testing backlog, then couldn't find enough people to test. The hope is this approach will finally strike the right balance. I think the opportunity for uh, probably improvement here is, is making sure that we have, we link the testing with a strategy. And that's what I think has been lacking in Ontario. Here's something else new, a temporary assessment center in one of Toronto's hardest hit neighborhoods. This combined with long promised mobile testing units could see resources directed where they're most needed. Four and five. We're really trying to determine what's going to be the most uh, reliable, sustainable and scalable approach across the province. If the Toronto area keeps suffering the biggest share of infections, other regions could be allowed to reopen sooner, something the Premier had resisted until now. And the more testing that we do, the better idea we have of uh, hot spots throughout the, the province. Behind every potential case, is a person with real worries like Trina Monez. I definitely go home if I knew that I wasn't carrying anything. There's still a long road ahead with COVID-19's first wave dragging into the summer. Thomas Dagg with CBC News Toronto. In Toronto, a COVID-19 outbreak at a homeless shelter has claimed two lives and forced the doors to close. Nick Purden talked to the executive director and a resident now in quarantine. 
behind these walls is St. Simon Shelter. And I've worked here for 20 years. And certainly... Bob Duff is practice, the executive director COVID. here. He's coming to terms with an outbreak of COVID-19 that has killed two residents from the shelter. The first loss we had was a gentleman uh, had lived with us for over two years. Could we have saved him? That'll always be the uh, question. Because of the deaths, everyone, all 45 residents here, were tested for COVID last week. And the results were staggering. 18 positive tests, and none of them showed any symptoms. Well, it's like a war, and it is. And the enemy's invisible. The shelter was shut down, and everyone with COVID was moved to this hotel near Toronto's airport. Michael Eschbach now waits in quarantine. Yeah, I see you. He'd been at St. Simon's for eight years. Michael, when you tested positive, what went through your mind? I'm dying. Mostly dying, or, or even worse, dying in horrible pain. What, what do you think people don't understand about being homeless and COVID-19? They ignored us. They, they left us out as cannon fodder for this virus. You think the city and the, the shelter should have done more? Way, way earlier, when they, they knew ahead of time, they knew the disaster was coming. Long -term Duff says at St. Simon's they did all they could, uh, but he acknowledges sense. against COVID it wasn't enough. Do you take some of the blame on yourself? I'd respond, I don't wish to, but I do because knowingly I should have said, no, we can't function at the number of beds we are. We're going to have to slash and perhaps close the doors. So you didn't want to do that? No. With thousands of homeless people in Toronto, closing a shelter can't be an easy option. Nick Purden, CBC News, Toronto. There are new questions tonight for the RCMP in Nova Scotia about last month's mass shooting. CBC News has learned they were warned about the killer almost a decade ago. Kayla Housel spoke to the son of a victim as she looked into this angle. She finally got her dream. For 10 years, Dawn Galenshin commuted back and forth between Ontario and Portapique, where her husband, Frank, lived. She was only able to join him permanently last summer. Both were murdered last month. Their retirement home set on fire. I'm more angry than anything. I'm angry that 22 people lost their lives and I really truly believe that this could have been prevented. Documents obtained by CBC News show that in May 2011, nine years ago, a municipal police officer in Truro got a tip. He was told Gabriel Wartman had stated he wanted to kill a cop, that Wartman had guns and might be transporting them back and forth between his denture clinic in Dartmouth and his cottage in Portapique. The officer issued this bulletin to warn police forces across the province. Officer safety bulletins are, are very serious in the policing world, of course. Um, they're not issued all the time. They're only issued, uh, you know, for very serious uh, matters. When the Halifax Regional Police received that bulletin back in 2011, they opened an investigation because the Dartmouth Clinic is within their jurisdiction. But the municipal force says it determined any information about the weapons was related to the Portapique Cottage, not in its jurisdiction, and so it forwarded that to the RCMP. The RCMP says it can't provide any information about what its officers did as a result of that bulletin. I don't know what was done or what wasn't done at the time. The RCMP says these bulletins are purged after two years. But on the second day of the shooting, another municipal force was able to dig up the bulletin and shared it with the RCMP that day. The Mounties insist they didn't have it as they responded to the rampage. I just don't understand it. I, there's so many questions and answers that, that we need as a family. Um, that we're just not getting right now. He is adding his voice to mounting calls for a public inquiry into the shooting spree that ended 22 lives. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. SpaceX suffered another letdown today after a rocket test ended with a dramatic fireball in southern Texas. Oh, you could hear that massive blast that set off car alarms and shook nearby homes. The failed test comes just a day before the spaceflight company is set to take part in an unrelated launch for NASA. 
which will send two astronauts to the International Space Station. Ottawa has banned cruise ships from Canadian shores this summer, and that's more bad news for the country's tourism industry. Telling the truth, it's going to be hard. Up next, how they're asking local residents to fill the gap. Plus, how to keep players safe. My interview with the head of the NHL Players Association about the league's plan to get back on the ice. And a sign of summer in Canada. So I said, I have a moose in my pool. Oh, she said. A moose in a pool in our moment. We're back in two. We're getting a clearer picture of COVID-19's impact on our economy. Statistics Canada reported an 8% GDP drop in the first quarter. March accounting for the brunt of that, down more than 7%, making it the hardest hit month since record keeping began in 1961. But early data suggests April could be even worse. Almost every sector of the economy is feeling the pinch, but tourism, well, it has been hammered. Today, Ottawa dealt a blow to the cruise ship industry. Stephanie Mercier looks at what could be a painful domino effect. Vancouver's beloved steam clock puffs away like always, but something's different. It's just not drawing the audience it used to. Pre-pandemic, when tourists came ashore from gleaming cruise ships, not this year. Cruise ships with overnight accommodation and a capacity of more than 100 persons that includes passengers and crew, will be prohibited from operating in Canadian waters until at least October the 31st. We've been making that boot since 1933. Gastown's OK Boot Corral has been selling cowboy boots and accessories to tourists for 40 years. The manager says most of his business is from cruise ships. Telling the truth, it's going to be hard. But we'll probably lose about 80%. But the pain of the loss goes beyond shops. Tour buses are parked. Tour guides sitting around. And the uncertainty is huge and that's very stressful. This time of year, Marlene Kumnik would typically be taking groups by bus to the Rockies. Right now, she doesn't have a single booking. The short term, it was inevitable that we wouldn't have the tours. I think it's more about next year. What's the recovery going to be like? It's the same situation in Victoria. It's a big hit. Maybe half of our business uh, comes for cruise ships during July and August, the busiest months. I feel bad for some of the students that I would normally hire. Uh, we're just going to do it with a skeleton staff. With the berths now sitting empty, some are hoping locals can help fill the gap. It's a great opportunity for Vancouverites, for all people of BC, to get out into their communities. We are hoping to uh, receive many locals and hope that they will begin to explore their own city. But even if some do, it won't make up for the roughly one million cruise visitors BC has now lost. Stephanie Mercier, CBC News, Vancouver. Next on The National, getting back on the court, diamond, and for many of us, the most anticipated, the ice. Pro sports are figuring out how to restart play safely. Next, the head of the NHL Players Association takes us inside the negotiations. COVID-19 shut down the sports world, postponing seasons and cancelling tournaments. It left athletes stuck at home looking for ways to stay busy and entertain their fans. Wipe it. Those fans so used to gathering now wondering when they'll be able to relive moments like this. It's a costly reality also facing amateur leagues across the country. A new normal that's led to some creative ways to pass the time. And some challenges for broadcasters. It is clear sports fans are eager for some kind of return, but how's that going to look? Here's Jamie Strachan with a preview and the risks. Can they keep it up for the full 90, though? Hazard's ball, Ellingham's 1-0. Around the world, the sports world is slowly beating back to life. Soccer in Germany with pumped-in crowd noise. Baseball in Korea with cut-out spectators and fans literally in bubbles. And other leagues like the British Premiership and Italian Series A have actual firm start dates. In North America, it hasn't been as smooth. 
Health restrictions, testing issues, logistics, and the willingness of players have stalled efforts. In baseball, wealthy players don't appear ready to make salary concessions for even wealthier owners. Our fans are telling us in overwhelming numbers that they want us to complete the season, if at all possible. The NHL canceled its regular season, but announced plans for a 24-team playoff tournament. But still, no firm dates. The NBA has a plan, too, to complete its season at Disney World. I think there's a good shot that it can happen, presume, presuming that we're able to get tests. The tests are you know, accurate enough to meet the safety standards that the league and the Players Association um, set. The NFL is the most confident, already releasing its 2020 schedule. I think there definitely will be a football season this year. The real question is, will there be fans in the stadiums? I think right now today, we're planning on having fans in the stadiums. Some experts wonder if all of these return to play scenarios are really worth it. Even if you have that testing, okay, so one person comes down with the virus, you know, you know, the NHL is trying to create a, a public relations success here. Can you imagine the public relations nightmare if one of the players dies? Drops the puck back, Petrangelo to the net, scores! If North American leagues do resume, the games will undoubtedly look and feel different and be accompanied with more risk than ever before. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Well, you heard from NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman about his plans for a return to play, but what about the players? Donald Fear is the executive director of the NHL Players Association. He's in New York City, and Mr. Fear, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Glad to be with you. Let's start with a question a lot of Canadians have. Uh, from your perspective, how likely is it that we'll have NHL hockey this summer? Well, I can't put a percentage on it. Nobody can. All I can say is that if the public health authorities determine it can be done safely, we want to be prepared, we want to be ready, and try and bring the game back uh, the latter part of the summer. And speaking of public health, we're being told that uh, Canadian cities are in the running to be one of those uh, so-called hub cities. But as you know, we currently have a 14-day quarantine period here in Canada for people coming in to the country. Uh, given you what you know about the league's position and, and the kinds of discussions that are going on, would that 14-day quarantine period be a deal-breaker? Uh, it depends on how it was enforced. If somebody left training camp and went into a Canadian city to play games and then couldn't play for 14 days, obviously that wouldn't work. If you could work out some relaxation way in connection with other public health measures that were taken, players could be quarantined except go to and from the arena, that might work. What are the concerns that you're hearing from NHL players about this likely or potential return to play? I, th I think the kind of concerns I'm hearing are the ones that you would expect. They're concerned just the way everyone else is about the public health situation. What could happen to me? What about my family? Are we sure that we can create this bubble, if, if you will, in which people are going to be reasonably free from the likelihood of infection? And all those kinds of things. Plus the general uh, fact that nobody really knows what this virus is going to do, how fast it's going to come back, if it's going to come back, and all the rest. Players are no different than anyone else in that regard. I guess one big difference with players, though, is you're dealing with a group of young, relatively young professional athletes, right? Like sort of, you know, very healthy, very fit. Uh, do you find that their level of concern and anxiety is different than what you are seeing in the general population? Or, or do they have the same kind of concerns that the rest of us do? Uh, it's hard for me to make that comparison. I can just say that while you're right, that they're basically young and fit and healthy, there's no doubt about that. They also have families, they have young children, they have parents, they have aunts and uncles. And so it's not just limited to what would happen with themselves. So you mentioned families, let's pick up on that. We've read that some players have raised concerns about potentially being isolated from their families for extended periods of time, especially if their team went deep into the playoffs. So how, from a Players Association perspective, how do you deal with that? It's very simple. You try and limit it to the greatest extent you can possible. And if it is conceivable that you can have families at some point, finals, let's say, come into the bubbles, you try and do that.
But players will not be isolated from families during the conditioning period, which we hope will get underway quickly, or during training camp, which will take place in the club's home cities. That would occur only when they move to the uh, hub cities, if you will. Hockey, as you well know, is uh, famous for, uh, you know, the, the ability of players to play through pain, to play despite having mm -hmm. injuries that would put the rest of us, you know, at home uh, absent. And yet we're in the situation where we're being told by health officials, at least in Canada, you know, even if you have sniffles, but certainly if you have anything that might be a symptom of COVID-19, you need to stay home. How concerning is that? for the Players Association. So in other words, a team is at a critical point in the playoffs and a player is feeling a little off. I, I feel it's going to be difficult for him to say, you know what, I'm not going to play tonight. Well, that's always going to be an issue. And it's fundamentally different than an injury because you know what you're dealing with in connection with an injury. But what we believe we can do is to set up sufficient testing and sufficiently frequent testing that that number of times that would be an issue would be an absolute minimum. Um, we'll have to do the best we can. Everybody in this situation has to do the best they can. One last thing, you know, from a fan perspective, we miss hockey. TV networks need programming. Owners presumably want some of those TV revenues. What's the motivation here for players to, to get these playoffs underway? I think it's a couple of things. First of all, they're doing this because they really, really want to play hockey. Secondly, this winning the Stanley Cup is really important to all players. It's something that stays with, with them quite literally for the rest of their lives. Third, it's a job. It's income. And fourth, you're concerned about the future of the league. And so all of those things weigh into it, but they're down the list from the health concerns. All right, Donald Fear, as I said, a, a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for doing this. Glad to be with you. So that's a look at what the NHL might do, but other hockey leagues are also trying to figure out what COVID-19 means for their seasons. In tonight's Pandemic Diary, a Canadian player in Austria shares what life has been like for him and his family. My name is Dylan Stanley. I am from Edmonton, Alberta, and currently I'm living in Feldkirk, Austria. This is where I play professional hockey. As an older player and, and somebody that's raising a family and, and with my wife here, it's, it's, it's a little intimidating. We were within a couple days of playing game one in the playoffs and we were matched up against an Italian team in Northern Italy and at the two week mark, they told us the season was done completely. No ice, no fans, no hockey. It was a little scary. Obviously, the income that you would have made in playoffs, you know, we would have pulled in about 5,000 fans a night. That's a, that's a lot of money for our clubs. And so as a player, you realize quickly that, that that's a lot less money that's coming into the club and somehow there's going to be a trickle down effect. You know, the new normal around here has been good. The stores are a little quieter. You got to wear the mask. With two young kids, we feel like we're able to do pretty much everything now. We just have to be a little bit cautious of what the rules are and, and how many people are maybe allowed in a certain space and things like that. How was school, buddy? You fun today? Couple of the pro boys. The professional players are getting back into small group training out the doors at the moment. And then I'm in charge of working with the youth players here. The Austrian Hockey Federation is trying to decide what's best for next year in terms of league, whether we decide to play cross-border with Italy and Slovenia or we don't. The uncertainty is it's difficult, but I think things will change quickly. Still ahead on the national. It's finally feeling like summer in parts of Canada. Even the moose are looking for a place to cool down. The story behind this picture-perfect dip is our moment. More than 7,000 Canadians have lost their lives due to COVID-19. They were grandparents, mothers, fathers, brothers, and sisters. Their loss now mourned by many. CBC News is trying to honor their memories with lives remembered. Tonight, Guillaume Lafortune shares his grandfather's story. My name is uh, Guillaume Lafortune. My grandfather, Claude Lafortune, passed away uh, from COVID-19 on April 19th, 2020. My grandfather was an artist and his paperwork was very beautiful. He created characters with uh, glue and paper and scissors. It's completely unique what he did. He was a TV show host from the 70s to 2000s. 
his two most famous were L'Évangile en papier and Parcelle de Soleil, in which every week a child who lived with a difference expressed their differences to make people understand that everybody, especially children, must be loved in their differences and not in spite of their differences. He was promoting diversity before it was obvious to everybody that diversity was a core value of our society. When he crafted his paper characters, he wanted to give them a soul. Samuel de Champlain, Beethoven, Victor Hugo with Notre Dame Cathedral burning beside him. I think he succeeded to give a soul to his paper sculptures. Hey. <laughs> he was a very loving person. I never saw him show malice toward anybody. If I could have been with him in his ultimate moment, I would have told him I loved him but also that he's been a role model for me in many ways, for all of his children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and for many people in our society as well. Quebec lost a great man. His influence is still a very uh, concrete today. And thanks to Guillaume for telling us about his grandfather. CBC News is committed to telling as many of these stories as we can, and if you'd like to share one, please send us an email to covid at cbc.ca. Still ahead on The National, the Canadian scientist figuring an early warning system for COVID hotspots. How testing sewage could help prevent a second wave. One underlying COVID-19 concern is whether there will be a second wave and how we can get ahead of it. Christine Birak shows us one unlikely clue. The murky sewage samples these technicians are collecting could be part of an early warning system for COVID-19. I mean, it's something we just flushed down the toilet, I and mean, it actually may be a very important part of the, of the investigation of this outbreak. Researchers say about half of people infected with the coronavirus are shedding it in their feces. The virus has a genetic fingerprint. Sewage samples can be tested just like throat swabs to reveal whether people in a community are infected. As opposed to testing every single person, you could actually test the waste outputs of an entire population to be able to see if it's there. An early study in the Netherlands detected the virus in the wastewater of remote towns up to six days before the first coronavirus cases were even confirmed. A more recent Australian study used sewage data to try and predict the number of people infected in a particular area. The range, however, was vast, from a couple hundred to more than a thousand. Testing wastewater isn't a new idea. Stats Canada did it last year to test the level and type of drug use in major Canadian cities. In the U.S., communities are looking to start testing sewage for coronavirus as early as the fall. And officials insist wastewater is safe. The virus itself does not survive in wastewater, and it's, it's critical. The data also can't reveal who's sick, but it will offer trends whether uh, infections are going up or going down uh, if you do this over a period of time. Canadian scientists are eager to start sewage testing, but they need federal approval. One way or another, some of this will be done. It's a question of how, how much uh, we're able to actually implement and how widely. A second coronavirus wave is expected. Experts say real-time data from wastewater testing could raise alarm bells and help with targeted lockdowns. Christine Birak, CBC News, Mississauga, Ontario. Next on The National, an early morning emergency call for a four-legged backyard intruder. What happened after this in our moment? A man in Ottawa was startled to see this in his backyard this morning. A moose in his pool. What happened next, of course, is tonight's moment. There was a moose thrashing around in the pool. Uh, the cover was on the pool overnight, so I think maybe the moose didn't realize it was water and stepped on the cover and in she went. We better call some people to find out what to do. Uh, so I called 911. I said, I have a moose in my pool. Oh, she said. And that's when everything started and she got in touch with Ministry of Natural Resources and we were always hoping she would get out and get back to her own place. It was about three hours. She seemed cold, but they, the water temperature is about 65 at the moment. 
and uh, I think she was just nervous. My wife said she wanted to give the poor moose a hug, and we were just hoping that she'd eventually get out and get back to her home base. Unfortunately, that's apparently what has happened. Other than my torn liner, all is well that ends well. I don't know moose. I, I don't know much about them, but from a distance anyway in that video, that moose actually looked pretty chill. And I don't mean cold, I mean calm in the pool. Anyway, that is our moment for tonight, and that is The National for Friday, May 29th. Have a great weekend.